You're listening to the Look Right Naked podcast. I'm your host, Eric Bach. This is the podcast for men and women who want to look right naked without living in the gym. If that sounds like you, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in. As far as the book goes, man, it's one of those things that um, it, it was never an intention. It wasn't something where I said, you know, hey, I want to write a book. Started as a personal trainer at a, a big box gym in my hometown. Did that for a couple of years. Ended up starting my own gym, House of Strength. Well, how do you make a choice that's aligned with your goals and your values if you haven't yet identified those? What is going on? It is Eric Bach, your host of the Look Great Naked podcast. And today I have an incredible guest with me, Ryan Muncy. Ryan is a high performance expert helping athletes athletes and entrepreneurs optimize their mind and body so they can make a bigger impact on the world. Ryan is also the author of Fuck Your Feelings. Ryan excels at sharing inspirational stories of people from all walks of life and provides you with the mindset and performance tools that you need to optimize your mental and physical performance. Ryan, so happy to have you here, man. I'm excited to talk about how to fuck your feelings and what we need to do to optimize not only the physical side of making a transformation, but the mental side. And Ryan, I mean, how did you come up with the world of, of fuck your feelings? How did you come up with that title? And where did that book originate? Eric, first of all, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I think you mentioned before we hit record that you're on my email list. You know, you've followed some of what I've done over the years. And, and the same is, is true in reverse. You know, I remember reading some of your early articles on T Nation and, and have kind of followed you along the way as well. So uh, it's really the first time we've had a chance to dig in and connect. So I'm looking forward to this as well. As far as the book goes, and it's one of those things that um, it, it was never an intention. It wasn't something where I said, you know, hey, I want to write a book. I actually, so back in, I guess a, a little bit of like brief bio, I went to Clemson, studied food science and human nutrition, uh, graduated in 08 and left Clemson, went to New York, spent a year in New York City as a Derek Zoolander wannabe. And realized that that's not how I wanted to spend my life. It's, it's funny when, when you told me the name of your podcast in our emails, uh, one of the gyms that I started at as a personal trainer when I was in New York, you know, everybody goes there to model and you end up doing other things. And so you know, there's a lot of catering and a lot of personal training uh, to pay the bills. But yeah. the, the gym was, uh, it was called David Barton Gym. And the t-shirts said, uh, look better naked. So, you know, I, I've, I've got love some it. experience with, with love the it, love podcast, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> came home from there in 2009 um, and uh, started as a personal trainer at a, a big box gym in my hometown. Did that for a couple of years, ended up starting my own gym, House of Strength, from 2012 to 2016. Sold that digitally native kind of, you know, podcasting uh, and, and some biohacking and health related companies. Uh, and, and that led to an opportunity to speak multiple times uh, at the biohacking summit, once in Finland and, and the second time was in Sweden. And that was in in the spring of 2007. Um, and so there's a point to sharing all this. The, the talk that I gave in 2017 uh, in Sweden at that summit was almost like me venting towards some of these biohackers that I saw kind of chasing a state at the expense of tomorrow. Um, and there was another speaker in the audience that saw my talk, came up to me afterwards and said, you know, hey, that was the best talk here. You know, there was hope and help on every single slide. It's like, you need to do more with this. And he just so happened to have a book deal in the works. And that was, like I said, in, in I think it was in May of 17. And I went up to New York City in July and he snuck me into a meeting with his literary agent. And I had some talks with them and they were like, hey, like we love the idea. You don't have a big enough following for us to give you the advance that you would want right now. So our recommendation is that you go on a two-year PR tour, build as big of a following as you can, and then come back and you know we'll see if we can get you a deal. I'm like, all right, well, if I'm going to do that, I'm just going to go on the PR tour and sell my book. Like, I'm not coming back to you in hopes that you'll give me something. Yeah. Uh, and so I was so excited on the flight home, you know, prior to you know, the, the meeting in New York that on the flight home, I just took the, the 45 minute talk, turned that into the outline for the book. And I had the whole book proposal written by the 4th of July, you know, and then I made that decision to write it on my own. And by, I think I said by Labor Day, I'm going to have the first draft written. I did that. And then we went through all the iterations and it actually launched in February of 18. But, you know, to, to your other part of that question, like fuck your feelings, the title, man, I tried so hard to make that not be the title. I, I know it's catchy and I'm yeah. glad now that that's what we did but 
you know, I wanted it to be something sort of like the high, uh, the neuroscience of high performance, but I also knew that nobody was going to buy that book. Like you're going to see that title and you're just like, oh, no, that's Not too down, heavy. Yeah. So we went on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. And I think I even talk about this um, in the book itself, but you know, number one, fuck your feelings is self-talk. It's something that I say to myself a lot. It's also very relevant to what we get into, you know, both in that talk that I gave and in the book, and, and we'll dive into it here some if we want, but in the first chapter of the book, I share some research from a guy named Antonio Damasio, who's a cognitive neuroscientist. And you know, he discovered through his work that his number is 95%. I always tell people, don't get hung up on the number itself. Just realize that an overwhelming majority of our decisions, right? So his number is 95% of our decisions are made based on how we feel in that given moment. And as soon as I heard that, I just, it was like a big aha moment for me because wow. prior to writing the book, a question that had fascinated me for years, and you mentioned again, before we hit record, my transition out of the gym and into the work that I do now, um, I got really tired in the gym of people coming in on Monday saying, what do I need to do to undo what I did on Saturday and Sunday? Right. And I'm sure you deal with this. You know, yeah. you have people that come to you and they say, Hey, I, I want a college scholarship to play X sport, or, you know, I'm a 39 year old dude and, and I want to lose this, or, you know, I've got this goal, right? The X's and O's when you first get into strength and conditioning are, are fascinating. It's fun, but at a certain point, when you keep running into these obstacles, I became much more fascinated with that question of why are your actions not aligned with your goals and values, right? You tell me you want X, but you're doing all the things that, that don't lead to that. Like we, we need congruency and alignment with your actions and those no stable goals and outcomes. And, and that became my fascination and, and the work that I was doing. And then it led to that talk in the book. And so, you know, when I heard that statistic from Antonio Damasio, it was like, oh, well, there you go. People are making decisions based on how they feel in that moment instead of making a choice that's aligned with the thing that they want most or that they say that they want. Yeah. And that's so powerful. You know, you mentioned the example of how do I undo what I did over the weekend when people come in on Monday and how often do you, and people listening right now, how often do you think I need to get to the gym today? I'm not most motivated. I need to work on my side hustle. I'm not motivated, you know? And to that, I'd say, listen, anybody who's ever built anything great, whether it's a body, a business, a book, a relationship had to find a way to do things when they weren't necessarily motivated. And so much success comes from being over, being able to overcome a lot of that self-talk, that immediate emotional feeling that we have in the moment. It's like that little shit standing on our shoulder that knows exactly how to talk shit to us and pull us out of alignment for what we want to do most. And so much of success comes from being over to hear that, but not react, not follow through on those emotions that don't necessarily support our goals. You know, I think so many people run into issues because they consume information. They consume all the tactics, all the methods, all the things that you could need, for example, to build a great body. But what holds them back? Well, it's the game up here, right? It's the mental side of things. And so in terms of our feelings, like why do you think they have such an impact in terms of our decision-making process. And when you're working with somebody who maybe consistently says, hey, I, I want to accomplish this particular goal, but they're acting out of alignment, what type of things do you do to help get people back into alignment? You know, when you talk about that little shit on our shoulder that kind of knows how to needle us and, and move us in a certain direction, it's funny because one of the analogies that I always share in a speaking situation or workshops, you know, we, we have... Uh, we'll call it two maybe parallel universes in our brain that are, I like to think of it as playing tug of war to see who's in control, right? One of them is the limbic system. The other is the prefrontal cortex. The limbic system, uh, I'll, I'll anthropomorphize these and say like, you know, the limbic system is the devil on one shoulder in the old cartoons and prefrontal cortex is the angel on the other shoulder, right? And so there, there's a lot that, that goes into, you know, understanding these, but, you know, just for, for the sake of time here, the short version would be, you know, the limbic system is where emotions lie. It's the older portion of our brain. Some people, you may have heard of it as uh, the, the lizard brain or the reptilian brain. It is wired for survival and it has evolutionary advantages. It's not all bad. It is a self-regulating system, however. And I always tell people, you know, hey, tell me any self-regulating system that doesn't overstep its boundaries right? doesn't happen. So it's up to us to be vigilant over that and keep it in check. Um, 
know, the prefrontal cortex, on the other hand, uh, you know, just to kind of compare these, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex is the, the wise old sage. It's, it's the angel. It's capable of abstract thought, beliefs and concepts like deities, ghosts, you know, things that are, are common amongst humans, but maybe like, you know, say an animal like a deer doesn't understand the concept of a god, right? Um, they don't have that prefrontal cortex, right? The limbic system is, again, it's wired for survival. Uh, it's it's the emotional, hormonal driven teenager, and it's incapable of thinking beyond the now. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, and so these two systems are always operating. They're always on. And, and I always give people the example of how the limbic system can be beneficial to us, right? Again, it's not all bad. If you and I are walking down a path in the woods and you see a snake before I do, your first reaction is your arm goes out and you stop me. And then you say, stop snake, right? And I always ask people in a, in a, a workshop or a speaking situation, we, we go through this and I say, well, why did you put your arm out first? Why didn't you speak first? And the answer is the arm going out is a limbic response. It's nonverbal, right? The limbic system is faster than the prefrontal cortex. Language lives in the prefrontal cortex. So our immediate response when you walk past the bakery at Whole Foods is, oh man, those cookies smell amazing. And then your second response, the prefrontal cortex is, oh, but I'm on a diet. Oh, but I don't eat gluten, whatever the things are, right? So people yeah. get caught up in the fact that they have the two responses. And then they start to wonder, well, what's wrong with me? And then there's judgment and shame and this whole negative downward spiral where like, why did I immediately want the thing? Like what's wrong with me, right? Um, why was the, the second reaction the second reaction? Well, it's because you're human, you're wired that way. That's the normal response. But we don't have to act on every single limbic response. And so, you know, to your question, what I'm trying to do is help people understand, A, that this is normal. This is how you're wired. This is how, like, it, this is your user's manual for being a human. And then awareness creates choice, right? So now we have a choice in that moment of, am I going to choose based on what the devil says on my shoulder or the angel on this shoulder, right? And again, it's, we want to make choices that are aligned with our goals and our values, and so the third part of this is, well, how do you make a choice that's aligned with your goals and your values if you haven't yet identified those? So again, in a lot of speaking situations, I'm in a corporate setting and I'll say, you know, hey, raise your hand if you know the company values here. And everybody's hand goes up and, you know, they're, they're rattling them off. Okay. Keep your hand in the air if you know your personal values. Like, what do you stand for? What do you stand against? On, you know, and, and there's a whole list of prompts that can help people identify their values. But the point is, most of us as an individual have not thought about who I am, what my values are, what I stand for. And if we don't know those, how can we use those as a, a, a scaffolding or a decision making? matrix through which we judge our decisions and our actions. So, you know, that's, that's where we would start, you know, what, totally is, makes sense. what do you want? Yeah. What do you want? Who are you? You know, how do you want to move through life? How do you want to be seen? What kind of impact do you want to make? Start there. And then it's realizing in each individual moment, you're going to have a choice. Do you want to act in accordance with those? Or are you going to act based on how you feel in this given? I love it. That's such a, a simple, straightforward way to really put it, right? Like if we don't have the underlying idea of what our values really are, and then we're basing a reaction that happens subconsciously on that, it's like we're always going to be out of alignment with what we truly want to do. So it, it comes back to pulling back and actually identifying what are the things that are most important for you, right? Like one, you know, hook thing that we say, you know, consistently, you know, with, with Bach performances, look great naked without living in the gym. Now there's a lot to unpack with that particular phrase, but the overall aspect of it is, is build a, a body, build a lifestyle where your life is improved by fitness, but not completely consumed by it. And one big issue that I see consistently is people want the result of something that happens when somebody's fully consumed by fitness without the mindset first to understand what goes into it, what sacrifices have to be made in that regard. And then when we factor in things like misalignment of different you know, marketing that people see on social media, impractical you know, expectations, people always feel out of alignment, right? They feel like everything that they're doing is a failure because that initial understanding of what they want to accomplish and what goes into it isn't based really in what's, what's realistic for everything else that they have going in their lives. And now, one thing that you mentioned was the limbic system, right? That, that kind of that immediate reaction. Personally, I have noticed a huge increase in 
fear-based decision making over the last couple of years. You know, many things go into that. Everyone listening can probably think about, you know, 2020 and COVID and everything from there. This isn't a political discussion, but it's something that I've noticed as a coach consistently, right? And to me, I see so many people with a lot of chronic stress and a lot of self-criticism comes from that. What role do you think kind of this chronic lower grade stress that people have really seemed to to amplify a little bit more over the last few years plays a role in this decision-making process? Yeah, it's a good question. And and again, I think it's something, it goes back to kind of staying vigilant over, um, you know, where we're giving our focus and, and, and our energy. Because of what I just outlined with the limbic system, we have to keep in mind that as humans, we're wired to look for what's wrong. That's a really really important piece of information to keep in mind. It goes far back into our history as, as you want, whatever belief system you have for how long we've been here. We haven't always had food security. We haven't had electricity. We haven't had the conveniences and comforts of you know modern life, even go back just 200 years, 250 years, completely different world. And constantly looking for what was wrong or looking for threats to our survival is how we stayed alive. So... <laughs> Again, we're wired to do that. Now you combine that with this environment where you know technology and connectivity have accelerated exponentially, right? And we have information coming in at, at rates that are orders of magnitude higher than even when you and I were kids, right? Much less, you know one, two, three generations ago. So our biology hasn't changed. Um, so so our, I don't want to say that our, odd, our lives are at odds with our biology, but to an extent, that's probably fairly true. So we just have to be aware that A, we're wired to look for what's wrong. And a lot of people who control media understand that polarity drives engagement. So, and, and, and not even people in control of media, people like you and me that, that may have an account and just want clicks. Right? Uh, so, so we're in an age where attention is currency, right? And engagement is currency uh, on, on all forms of media, on all platforms. YouTube wants you to spend as much time on their platform as they can. You know, Facebook is counting how many seconds, Instagram is counting how many seconds you're on that platform every single time you log in. You know, they've got algorithms that calculate how much money you're worth every time you log in, right? It's all about attention. What gets attention? What gets engagement? It's polarity. Nuance or, you know, things that are in the middle don't get engagement, they don't get clicks, they don't get response. So the game for everybody, whether it's in politics or business or fitness, is to be as divisive and polarizing as possible, right? If I if I wanted to, you know, blow up a fitness business right now, I might do something like, you know, say, you know, the, the further on one end of the spectrum you go, the, the more attention you're going to get, right? That's yeah. the point. And so for us, to your question, it's, it's, again, it's awareness creates choice. Having an awareness of this is how we're wired. This is the environment that we're in. What happens when those things combine? How do I want to respond and react to that? How do I want to engage with that? It's about being intentional and being in control of our life, not being this, you know, goldfish in a tank that's constantly following, you know, a, a shiny object. No doubt. And that's one of the toughest things, right? Because, you know, as you alluded to, whether we're talking about content in the form of a social media post or a headline or a news story, polarity, driving clicks is the game, right? Essentially, it's you have to be able to get people in the tent before you preach. And so where this creates a lot of issues, specifically when it comes to personal development, when it comes to health, when it comes to losing fat, building muscle, whatever it is, there's going to have to be almost a hook that draws in people's attention for it to even get any weight. And many times that's going to lack context. And information without context might build a base of knowledge, but it doesn't build wisdom. And it's through wisdom and knowing what tools to apply at what time is when truly people can transform their mindset, their lives in all these different areas. And that's something that I think has really gotten lost, especially over the last couple of years as social media and everything has you know accelerated dramatically. You know, um, I was having this conversation with colleague uh, Andrew Coates a couple of weeks ago in his podcast. And uh, we were talking about eight years ago, right? If you were trying to grow you know, an online coaching business, you could write a couple blog posts, two, 3,000 words. They would take a long time. But you know what? You would post them on a social media platform. You would drive thousands of views to it. People would get a lot more context to what it is. And now it's a five to six second TikTok or reel. And then, you know, you get a bunch of people who are angry that there's not a, a magnum opus thoroughly describing each piece of, of what the content is, you know? So it's a really interesting world to be in both as a, as a creator, but also a consumer. And so I think what's, what's important in really understanding is 
understanding, yeah, how we're wired, also how the information that we're consuming is being positioned and being able to pull back and being the driver in your own learning experience and asking good questions like, okay, now what is the context of this before just trying to apply different strategies directly across the board, right? Because that's one of the biggest battles that I see. People start to get this monkey mind. They start throwing everything against the wall. Then nothing works. And then there's fear. And then there is self-loathing. There's feeling like a failure across the board. And it just creates this negative narrative where it becomes incredibly difficult to truly have a transformational progress really in any realm. Yeah. I mean, so what I wanted to, to ask you is like, when you find yourself in one of these temporary states, how do you pull out of that? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, and, and it's funny going all the way back to that talk that I gave in Sweden, one of the key concepts there was this idea of states and traits. Okay. And I really wanted, even then, folks to understand that a state is a short-term, transient, fleeting way of being. Uh, the state that we're in right now is not the state that we'll be in 30 minutes from now. Um, however, traits are characteristics that transcend these fleeting uh, states, right? And, and another way of thinking about this is climate versus weather, right? So um, if I say like, hey, do you want to go to Russia? Most people will, will bring to mind an image of bleak, cold, gray, dreary, snowy, Right. Well, like, I mean, there are some beaches in Russia. They have some nice days. Right. Uh, same thing in, in opposite. If I say Florida, most people think, you know, hot, sunny, beautiful beach. You know, well, what if we went on a day where there was a hurricane coming through? Right. And so, you know, those are not ideal. <laughs> uh, those are great examples of, of the difference between weather versus climate. Right. And, and so what we want to focus on is like, what is the climate of you? What are those traits that are, you know, more often than not the, the way that you show up and move through the world? Right. So, again, even Florida has rainy days. Even Russia has sunny days. We really have to understand that. Uh, and this is a difficult one for a lot of people to grasp. We're we're not I mean, we're human. Part of our existence is, you know, struggle and and trauma and like this idea that every single day is we fuck up. Yeah. This idea that every single day is going to be a 10 out of 10. It's not true. <laughs> um, and so, you know, some of it is just, again, it's, it's accepting that and, and understanding that, you know, Hey, today I don't have my a game. You know, I'm, I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm, I'm not going to go backwards. Uh, you know, that's where the move the chains analogy comes in. And it's just, you know, you show up, you do what you're supposed to do and, and you move on. And then tomorrow or, or even within a day, you know, again, these, these states are short term, they're transient. Um, and, and, and so again, go back and answer your question. There are a lot of, I think of them as tools in the toolbox, things that we can do that shift our states. So before I give you a couple of those, uh, I'm sure you've talked about most of them on the podcast before, but another important piece of information is, you know, I think about when I say this, uh, we want to be state independent performers. And, and the visual that I have in my mind when I say that is Michael Jordan in the flu game, right? Like I remember watching that game. Yeah. And so it's, it's one that I can vividly, you know, pull to the forefront of my mind and, and think about, right? And so, you know, if you want to be great, if you want to be successful, you have to be a state independent performer, meaning that you can show up and do what you're supposed to do, regardless of the state that you're in, regardless of how you feel physically or mentally, right? Um, and, and again, there are things that we can do, tools that we can have at our disposal that can help us shift our state. You know, again, go all the way back to that talk that I gave. I saw a lot of people, there are a lot of things that people can do to positively alter their state in the moment, but might be detrimental long-term. What I want people to do is look for tools or activities that can positively alter our state now and also positively benefit traits long-term. So things like yoga or meditation, breath work. Uh, for example, with meditation, there's research that shows that on average, a person over the age of 65 loses 20% of their temporal brain mass. The only group who has been spared that Wow. Structural brain loss are people who are medita uh, lifetime meditators, right? So, so that is a tool or a practice that has positive state shifting benefits in the now, but also long-term trait 
benefits, right? Um, so some other tools, you know, music is an easy one, right? You know, just have, and I'm sure a lot of people probably already have this. You go to the gym, you have a bunch of different types of music. You know, some days it's rap, some days it's, you know, hard rock, some days it's classic rock. Like you already, a lot of people already intuitively know some of these things, right? So music has been shown scientifically, you know, it, it can shift our states. Movement does. We've all seen the meme. You're 30 minutes away or one workout away from, you know, a better mood. Um, you know, I can put 30 seconds on the clock, tell you to do as many burpees as you can in 30 seconds and your state will change. So here's an important thing. I skipped this earlier. Um, neuroscience defines feelings as mental experiences of physiological states. That should make you really happy, Eric, because you know how to change someone's yeah. physiological state, right? Yeah, exactly. So the, the burpees thing, right? That's what made me think of it. Cause that's the example I always give when I, when I say that, right? So 30 seconds from now, you can be in a different state and have a different mental experience. It's that easy. Um, and, and so the point in having all of these tools at our disposal is because again, we're all going to have bad days. Some days the music works. Some days it doesn't. Some days journaling or, or meditation is the answer. Some days it's movement. Some days you need uh, breath work. Some days you do all the things and it's still, you're just blah, you know, and, and maybe that's just a, you know, maybe you're overtrained or maybe you didn't eat enough or maybe you didn't sleep well. There's a lot of different things that go into that. But the overarching thing is to just understand that not every day is going to be great. Do the best you can every day, regardless of the state, have some tools at your disposal to improve your state, you know, and, and just stay in the game. Yeah. You know, I mean, success does come down to the ruthless execution of the basics, right? And so when we take certain actions consistently, we can change our state. When we consistently change our state, we can start to begin to change our personality traits. Right. So if we want to look at something as simple as an action step of beginning a meditation practice, maybe you start with three minutes a day. Listen, some of those days you're going to feel like you're failing because you keep completely thinking about what's on your to do list, something that happened the night before, whatever the case. The important thing isn't that you are perfect with the meditation, especially meditation as an example. Your ability to refocus and get right back into it is really where the beauty becomes. That's where you start to develop that space to start to be in control and not react always to the little bastard on your shoulder who's trying to get you to act out of alignment, right? But I think really where this comes down is, yeah, it's all about getting those reps in. It's about that consistency aspect. You know, one thing I tell my clients consistently is if you have 10 workouts, three workouts are going to be like, hell yeah, I'm crushing it. Four are going to be like, yeah, you know, put in some work. And three, you're just not going to feel like being there, but you still have to show up, right? Because it, it's just all about getting those reps and being able to push through, especially when not everything is aligned. And as you mentioned, you know, high performers, the Michael Jordan game when he had the flu, an example, uh, Navy SEALs, I'm sure they're not always motivated, <laughs> I'm sure they're tired, but it's about being able to sometimes push those short-term emotions away and be able to do what has to get done regardless. In a perfect phrase, sometimes you just have to say, fuck your feelings and get the job done. And over time, it becomes easier and easier and easier. All right. So, yep. and something that you mentioned right here, so like, what if somebody comes to you and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm consistently, you know, acting out of alignment. I'm not motivated and I need to reset with maybe a daily routine. You know, what are some, what are three consistent things that I should be doing each day to start rebuilding that motivation and that discipline to be acting in alignment? You know, it, it's tough. Um, I, I think for me, if, if that was a coaching client before I said, these are the things I would have a follow-up question for them that would be, you know, what, what are the, what is the thing that you want to be doing that you're not, um, you know, because I think I, I know as a podcaster, kind of what you're going for with the question, but as a coach, it's such an individual answer. Um, yeah. you know, you, you have, you have to tailor those things to the individual either based on what it is that they want or what they're not doing or why they're doing the thing that isn't aligned. Um, so I think, you know, to, to make that individual and, and precise, there's a little bit more information required. Yeah. Hey, I'm 34 years old. I'm a dad. You know, I've, I've got a business right now, but I'm just not as consistent with what I need to be doing in the gym. I'm working, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day building my own business. But at the same time, I know that I need to take care of my health. I need to lead by example. And I feel incongruent 
when I'm not showing up at the gym, especially when I make that promise to myself to do it each day. Can you help me get back into alignment? Yeah. So, I mean, one would be, I think, shifting the thought of you being the reason that you're doing it to helping you. And, and this is going to sound cliche or, or cheesy, but a, a deeper why, right? We'll always let ourselves down. But if you can shift the reason that you're doing it to be, uh, to, to A, have more energy, to you know play with your son at the end of the day, um, or, or your kids at the end of the day. Uh, and, and then the second part of that same thing is, you know, to set an example for them. Like, you know, there's going to be times where they're going to be like, dad, I'm too busy. I couldn't get it all done. And you're like, well, you know, maybe spend less time on social media or, you know, watch less TV, whatever <laughs> they're doing. Right. And so it's up to you as the parent to model that behavior. Right. And so, you know, then turning that around, you know, now as the individual in, in, in our hypothetical, you're starting to see this through the lens of, OK, well, how are my actions being seen by the people that you know I'm raising and leading and responsible for? You know, am I setting the example for them? Right. And now we're kind of getting into something that's a little bit deeper. And like I said, you'll let yourself down, but you're not going to let your kid down. Right. So like you said earlier, like as a coach, like now we kind of have a hook in you. And and if you're dogging it, I'm like, you know, Eric, kids over there watching, what kind of example are you setting? I'm going to get a much better response from you in the session if I say that to you versus, you know, hey, Eric, you said you wanted to drop a couple of jean sizes like you're dogging it today. You're just gonna be like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm tired. It's not my best day. Like, like there's an out if, if it's about you. Right. Um, so, so that would be one way. Um, you know, that's kind of like yeah. on, the, on the mental side, on the approach, you know, there, there's also like the logistical side where, you know, maybe you are tired. Maybe you don't have enough time. You know, if your workout that's programmed is 90 minutes, well, maybe we need to cut that down to 45 minutes or 30 minutes. Like what can you realistically accomplish, uh, you know, in the given time that, that, you know, how much time can you allot to this practice? Right. And, and I know you've said, you know, uh, we want to look great naked without living in the gym. So you're probably not programming a 90 minute workout, but if the person, you know, having that issue is, you know, can we accomplish the same effect or, or get the same stimulus in, in a much shorter time? Right. So, uh, off the top of my head, those would be a couple of things I would look at. No, that's great. And I really love your response to the first portion of the question as well. I'm getting that deeper why, you know, I think one of the most important things that I've seen and, you know, when I'm talking with my clients, this is something we talk about, but is like, how does this particular result, how does this outcome of, of looking great naked, of losing fat, building muscle, improving health, how does that impact your life outside of what you see in the mirror, right? And in many cases, it's about showing up. It's about leading by example for your family. It's about maybe showing up with more confidence and building your business or representing your business and building your career, right? All of these things are interconnected. As you mentioned, right? Changing your physical state can change your mental state. And so all of these things tie in, in terms of being able to look, feel, and perform to the best of your ability. Now, I'd like to pivot just slightly, and I would like to talk about food, nutrition, just a little bit, right? And, you know, given where you are now in your life, hey man, you've been Derek Zoolander, you've been a high performing athlete, you know, what type of things do you recommend for people to optimize their cognitive state when it comes to nutrition? Like what types of foods, any particular strategies that you lean into? I think for me, it, it's easy to immediately start to think about, oh, we could, we could do this or we could do that. Like, I, like I have a couple of kind of pathways that I might follow myself and, and go back and forth between them in different phases of my year based on how I'm training. But that's so far down the, uh, the road in terms of the changes. And so I think I have to be cognizant of that, you know, before I jump into, you know, the, the end state, it really starts with eliminating a bunch of the shit that the average person eats. Um, I was really yeah. fortunate that when I was in school, uh, so I was I was at Clemson from 02 to 08. So in the early 2000s, um, I had, you know, we had, we had all the science classes and then we had the nutrition classes. And everything we learned in science, you know, anatomy, physiology, metabolism, biochem, okay, understand all this. Yeah. Then we go to the nutrition classes, you know, and I've got this overweight teacher that doesn't look healthy and she's, you know, trying to tell me, 
All foods fit. There are no bad foods. Uh, you know, if someone's diabetic, we're going to reduce their carbs from 60% of their calories down to 50% of their calories. And I'm the kid in the back of the class, yeah. like eating a can of tuna. And, you know, everybody's looking to rack. Like, what's that smell? I'm like, yeah, that's me, dude. And you know, I'm, I'm not asking the teacher. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like, why? Like, I, that's not true. That's not what we learned in biochem. That, and they're just like, you know. They just want me to shut up. They don't want to. They don't want to answer the question. So, long story short, I, I say I was really fortunate to have that exposure early on because I saw then what everybody is yelling about now on social media, right? That um, you know, big food, big pharma. You know, they're controlling the narrative on you know the whatever my plate, my pyramid, whatever we call it now. Uh, you know, I chose not to become a registered dietitian at that time because I didn't want to pay to do an internship to be a part, part of that orthodoxy that was preaching what isn't accurate. Um, and so, you know, if we want to be a high performer, if we want physical health, if we want mental health, you know, we need to avoid um Man, the list of things to avoid is so long. I'm going to forget some things, but, you know, you got to cut out the seed oils, um, you know, obviously cutting out all processed foods, you know, it, it basically, I mean, at one time you could tell people shop uh, around the perimeter of the grocery store. I, I don't even know if that's true anymore. There's so much, you know, bullshit that, that has found its way there. Um, yeah, it's you know, getting tougher, man. It, it, it is. I mean, if you're focusing on real whole foods, you're going to get 90% of the way there. You know, if we wanted to get into the like nitty gritty of, you know, keto or, you know, bodybuilding plan or, you know, things like that, like that's fine. That's fun. We can debate that all we want. But if you're still eating, you know, uh, you could be keto and guzzling corn oil. You're not going to be healthy, right? Or, or you could be a bodybuilder, and you know if you're eating, yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, mercury laden farm tilapia. You know, we're going to have some problems there too. So, uh, you know, there, there's there's things that we really have to look at first, and it's you know don't put the things into your body that are going to destroy. Uh, you know, your cellular machinery and, and the way that those things work. Um, so hopefully yeah. that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the toughest concepts, right? Like one thing I always like to say is focus on foods that came directly from the earth or had a face. And that's like a very simple way of being like, Hey, that's going to help you eliminate most processed foods. And then if we want to start stacking layers on top of that, it's like, yeah, try to avoid things that actually have a label on them. You know what I mean? Like most of the foods should be single ingredient foods. You shouldn't have to look at an apple and be like, Hey, what's in this apple? You know what I'm saying? And so if you focus on those big rocks, that's going to clarify so much. And, uh, and Ryan, like there's definitely a tendency for people to, you know, get, get so focused on whatever diet is particularly trending now, whatever coach or influencer is talking about, you know, one diet that is driving a lot of clicks while missing the foundational pieces that really drive the success of any particular dietary strategy, you know, and it's amazing how many people you talk to that are experts that at the end of the day, what is the most important thing? Eating really the best quality foods that you can, keeping minimally processed foods at a very minimum, um, eating the best quality you know, lean protein sources and vegetables as you can, right? So if you feel overwhelmed with all the information out there, that's what you should be focusing on. Not any particular dietary strategy and trying to go too far down that rabbit hole until you've mastered that foundational aspect. Because once you get that foundation, you know what? You're probably going to start to find what really fits for your body, how you feel mentally on certain foods, how you feel physically, inflammation, bloating, all of these components are really tie into your overall, overall wellness. And, you know, as, as Ryan has covered thoroughly here, it's like, it's all connected. And so we can start to upgrade the foods you're putting into your body. You're going to start to upgrade your mindset, and your performance across the board. So Ryan, man, this has been excellent. Love having you on here. You know, where can we find out more about you? What is the best place? Well, um, I used to tell people Instagram, but um, as you said before we hit record, I, I've really pulled back. I'm, I'm really not posting there. So I would say um, you can go to my website, ryanmuncie.com. Uh, I, I do email daily right now, um, talk about all things performance, leadership, mindset. Um, you know, so, so if you want to hear more, you can do that. Uh, obviously, I'd love for you to read the book, Fuck Your Feelings. Uh, you can get signed copies on the website. It's just, it's on Audible. Uh, I'll read it to you if you don't want to hold the paperback version. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's it. <laughs> you do have a great 
podcast voice. Yeah. So the, the podcast is a better human project. And if and when we start doing more episodes again, uh, we'll have to get you back on there and reciprocate. No doubt, brother. Well, thank you so much for being here. Everyone, make sure you check out Um I do recommend subscribing to his newsletter. His daily emails are phenomenal. And I am somebody who curates the information that I consume like crazy. So um, that is one email that I'm looking for each and every single day. It's always chock full of valuable tips and tricks and things that you can use to level up every aspect of your performance. Ryan, thanks a lot, brother. Catch you soon. Hey, it's Eric here again. Before heading out, I want you to shoot me a message over on Instagram at Bach Performance. So let me know what do you want to hear next on the podcast? And we'll create an episode specifically for you. Until next time, my friend, remember fitness should improve your life, not consume it. Did you find this helpful? If so, pound that like button and hit subscribe. Now, if you want a free copy of our chiseled muscle cheat sheet, the no BS way to help you lose body fat and build lean muscle in 90 days, make sure that you go to the description below and download your free copy. Any questions, drop them in the comments and can't wait to see you with the next video.